Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar La Today we are present at the Azawiya in Cape Town. With us is Sheikh Siraj Hendricks, who is the third generation of Sheikhs who've been teaching the Ikhya Ulum ad Din of Imam Al Ghazali. Sheikh Siraj, Assalamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Assalam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh, Sheikh. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Tell us something about the, the tradition of the Ikhya at this institution called the Zawiya. You're the third generation that has been teaching this. this very beautiful book of Imam Al Ghazali, Rajallahu An. Oh, yes, <coughs> of course, it started with our grandfather, Sheikh Muhammad Saleh Hendricks, um, who is reputedly the first ever to bring the Ihya to South Africa. And uh, because, of course, he also belongs to the Ba'alawi Tariqa and was one of the, the chief sheikhs, in fact, within that order, um, it is a virtual custom of the Ba'alawi Tariqa to, um, to teach the, the Ihya as one of the staple texts at all of the institutions, in fact, throughout the world, whether it's here, with Siddhar Mustafa, and so many other institutions throughout the world. So he was the first, but he started teaching that long before he built the Azawiya. In fact, he met um, considerable opposition um, against uh, teaching the, the Ihya. The reasons for that? Uh, there was a lot of ignorance at the time, of course, um, but not to be condemned because there were particular social, political circumstances that had, in fact, um, contributed to that sort of ignorance. But the relations, of, the relations have all mended, and there is no hard feeling about this. And uh, that was one of the reasons why he got together with a number of uh, sympathizers and uh, decided to bowl the Azawiya in 1920. Now that happened as he arrived in Cape Town in 1903, as the Cape Time shows. Um, his arrival was on the front page uh, of the Cape Times at the time. And uh, that was in 1903. So for about 17 years, he was teaching the Hia at various uh, mosques throughout the Cape, particularly up in the Bukab section that we know now, and also at home. He had private classes at home. But I think that the opposition he encountered um, became somewhat discouraging. And uh, prompted by his students, uh, he decided to build this place with their assistance. And in 1920, it was founded. What has been the, the impact and the influence of the teachings of the Ikhya on the students of the Zawe? There must have been many people who have been affected by it. Immense. Uh, there's a large body of students here, as you know yourself, Shafiq, and uh, it continues in that way up to the day. We are operating on what I would call a, a, uh, a reserve tank of the baraka, of the blessings left behind by his efforts and his commitment uh, to the deen. But it has inspired generation after generation. Um, as I mentioned, uh, in my, my talk on the uh, Kitab al-Halal al-Haram, my first exposure to the Hiyah was in fact that at the age of 18. And I was fascinated by this book, um, which he taught on, on, on Sunday mornings. And that went on for years. In fact, uh, when I, in my, as an undergraduate, before I left for Makkah, um, I did my, uh, my major was in psychology. And we had a project on that year dealing with the age. It was the year of the aged. And I selected four members of the mosque committee and uh, Sheikh, Hamad, uh, Sheikh Mahadi um, as the fifth one. And in my interview with him, I spoke about his relationship with the unseen, his relationship with the Akhirah, because he was a man of about 70, 71 at the time. 
and I invariably uh, the issue of the Ihya came up and the influence and impact it had on him as a person. And he mentioned that towards the end of the interview, he mentioned to me that he had completed his reading of the Ihya, his 20th reading of the Ihya. I was astonished when I, when I heard that. Fast forwarding, uh, many years later, coming back here and after having received my own copy of the Tukhfatul Labib from our great late uh, Sayyid Muhammad Ali al Maliki. Um, I read within the Tukhfatul Labib of Abu Bakr bin Sumayt, who was a very close associate of his while he was in Zanzibar, that it is part of the words of the Ba'alawi Tariqah to complete, at least in your lifetime, to complete the reading of the Ihya 20 times. It is stated within the Tukhfatul Labib. And I was completely amazed by the circumstance. And at the time I wasn't aware of that fact that it is in fact a wird to complete it 20 times. Can one safely say that uh, for at least 800 years the Ikhya has been transforming the inner soul of, of humanity? Oh yes, it's, I think it's obliterated virtually everything else that has been written on Islamic ethics, Islamic spirituality. Uh, what we have to recognize and understand is that the Ikhya has gained its fame not specifically because of the legal aspects that you find in there. In fact, it deals quite cursorily with them. Uh, the Kitab al-Bay, for example, which I did uh, as one of the, as part of this program, um, if you compare that to his Al-Wasit, which is on our shelves here, it is a condensed version, a distilled version of, uh, of that particular work. And I suppose that he selected those few because they were most likely the most practiced aspects of the, uh, you know, um, of, of, of trade during that particular time. Um, but his, his work on his, his examination of, of that particular aspect is immense elsewhere. But where it excels in is dealing with the human condition. And that is, to me, I think, what has so profoundly influenced and in fact altered and changed the dynamics and the course and even the history of Islamic thought. I like what Cyril Glass says about him in the Encyclopedia of Islam. He says that at the time that Imam Ghazali lived, there were so many factions and sects, confusion, um, useless debates going on, vying for rank and status. Islam to him was, in Glass's vision, appeared to be one of a puzzle, a scattered puzzle lying around. Imam Ghazali came along and saw all the bits and pieces and with his acumen, his intelligence and his connection with the essential message of Islam, which is spirituality, tasqiyatul nafs, the purification of the soul, tarbiyatul ruh and tarbiyatul irada, the, the, the disciplining and the training of the will. Um, and the tasfiyat al the purification of, 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 of the soul. He had seen this and realized and recognized that the cause of all this dissension and conflict and animosity was that people had lost sight of the greater and the deeper purposes of Islam. And that is, I think, what compelled him to the point where he had, in fact, left his family, went on this long spiritual odyssey of his in order to, to connect, to reconnect, with the spirit of Islam, and it is in that that he excelled. So the Ihya should not be read as a work of fiqh, primarily, but one that, in the tradition of the spiritual alchemist, tries to alter and transform the, the inner nature of the human being, the heart, the soul, the mind, the spirit. And up till today, there are various works of akhlaq here, and spirituality here, it appears, in my opinion, that he remains unequaled in that particular project. You've now given us the, the context of, of who Imam al-Ghazali is. Now, how do you place him within the context and the traditions of the Zawiyah itself? I think it's the, it's the one, it's the message, I think, with which um, my grandfather connected um, very profoundly. And, uh, it is no coincidence that when he returned to Cape Town that that was the very first work 
that he had taught. I have a list of works that I will show you later on and that he had taught here at the Azawiya. But that formed the center of the teachings mm -hmm. of this place. As a matter of interest right now, I mean, just give us some examples of, of the kind of works that uh, Sheikh Mohammed Saleh, the founder of the Azawiya, yeah. taught um, um, in, his, in his day. The, uh, apart from the Ihya, of course, it's quite mind-boggling. Um, and I will quote this from my, my thesis that I had written on him. And uh, I was staggered when I did the research and realized after my research how, how little, in fact, I knew the man. Let me just give an example of the thick works that he, that he taught here, all of these traditional works and still taught at traditional institutions such as Darul Mustafa and elsewhere, even at Zaytuna today and, and others um, who, who are active in, 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 in re-excavating um, that traditional legacy of, of classical Islam. For example, in Fiqh, he taught the Risalat al-Jamia by Sheikh Ahmed bin Zaid al-Habshi, for example. One that is taught across the world, Indonesia, Malaysia, Malaysia the entire Southeast Asia. He taught the, the Matan al-Ghaya wa taqrib commonly known as the Abu Shuja' um, after that. And that's by uh, Al-Qadi Abu Shuja' Ahmed bin Hussein ibn Ahmed al-Asfahani. That is for intermediate, intermediate um, students, the Risalat al-Jamia for beginners. And then also a sharh, a commentary on the, um, risa on the uh, Matn al-Ghaya by, Ibrahim, by Sheikh Ibrahim al-Bajuri. And uh, the Mughni al-Muhtaj. Now the Mughni al-Muhtaj, which has been written uh, by Muhammad al-Khatib al-Shirbini, also became another staple text yeah, at the Azawiya um, in, in fiqh. Mm -hmm. Because one of his main um, teachers in, in fiqh was, in fact, uh, um, a Sheikh uh, ba, ba Junaid, um, who was, in fact, buried amongst the, in the Alawi section um, of the Ma'ala in Mecca, the, 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 the Makbar in Mecca, which you have visited. Um, he was so honored by the Ba Alawiyah himself. Um, uh, it was quite amazing that Sheikh Bajanaid had lived to the healthy age of what, 99. So he, his sons too got him as a teacher. Um, Sheikh Mahadi, Sheikh Ibrahim, Sheikh Ahmed unfortunately passed away while, while he was in Mecca. And they too ta uh, were taught the Mughni al-Muhtaj of Sheikh Ash-Shirbini uh, uh, um, by the very same, self-same um, Sheikh, Sheikh Bajanaid. And then the Minhaj al-Talibin, of course, of uh, Imam Abu Zakaria, Sharf and uh, al Nawi, um, and how uh, Maraktul Falah, Shah Nurul Idah, by Sheikh Hassan bin Amr, uh, bin Ali Sharan Balal al Hanafi, which is a Hanafi text, because he was instrumental in trying to defuse the Hanafi conflict that had emerged uh, at the turn of, this, of the uh, 20th century. So these were some of the, the fake books alone that mm -hmm. were taught from morning to night. You had an entire entourage of, of the Sadat, 20 to 30 of them, um, whom he taught up to from about 8 o'clock in the morning up to 10 o'clock um, at night. In Tafsir, of course, the famous um, taf Tafsir of, uh, of, of Jalalain by Imam Jalaluddin al Siyuti. He had passed away and then it was completed by Imam Jalaluddin al, al Mahalli. The Jalalain is universally known throughout all and traditional institu institutions. And of course, the famous tafsir, Al-Kabir, of Fakhruddin Al-Razi, which was also continued by um, Sheikh Mahdi. Sheikh Mahdi was completely in love with that particular tafsir, and that one I enjoyed. In particular, that, that's with regard to tafsir, Usul Fikri, Al-Warakat, for example, of Imam Al-Harmain Al-Juwaini, -Al all of the works. I've just finished the Warakat, as you know, with our students um, on, 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 tu on Tuesday nights. The Mustasfa of Al-Imam Ghazali, another staple text, yeah. Um, and then the Minhaj al-Wusul ila ilm al-Usul by al-Qadi Nasruddin, Ibn Abdullah, Ibn Abi Qasim, Ali, Amr al-Baydawi, Shaykh al-Baydawi, uh, which is an immense work um, on, on Usul Fiqh. And in Grama, of course, the Ajrumiya, and also the, the Al-Fiya of Imam Malik. All of these works were, were taught. Akida, the Akida of the uh, Al Awam, of Sayyid Ahmed al Marzuki, the Umu Barahim, the Jawhar al Tawheed. I mean, these are all the, the, the staple works in Tasawf, of course, the Tuhfat al Labib um, of the famous um, Sayyid Ahmed bin Sumayd, the Nasaih, which I taught on Thursday nights, 
by Sheikh Abdullah ibn Ali al-Haddad and of course the Ihya Ulumuddin. These were some of the staple texts that were taught. But um, the students also graded depending on the on the rank and you know the understanding of Arabic and so on. So they had the general classes and then they had the more um, specific the khususi, you know, you know, those of the khusus um, as they were, um, whom he taught, and th they were smaller groups. Sort of the, 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 the more elect of the students, in other the, words. Yes, the more elect of them, I would, I would say. And most of them then went on to become imams at the place or elsewhere. Let's, uh, ha having looked at the, the amazing um, tradition of the Zawiyah through Sheikh Muhammad Saleh Hendricks, its founder, yeah. Your uncles, uh, Sheikh Mahdi, Sheikh Ibrahim, unfortunately, Sheikh Ahmed passed away in yeah. Makkah. Yeah. Now yourself, uh, Sheikh Siraj, and of course your brother, Sheikh Ahmed. But the, the Azawi does exist in, in a wider context, doesn't it? And the Azawi was founded almost before the days of apartheid. But, but give us some of, something of the history of, of Islam at the Cape. Um, yeah. Where do we basically come from? Oh, from all over, basically. Um, ma ma well, of course, mainly from India and uh, from, uh, from Southeast Asia. Um, although the impact, of course, of the Indonesians and Malaysians um, has been much more significant than, than any um, other country. And uh, most of them initially arrived as slaves. Uh, it was Dutch, East India, English. And, and, and how many years ago did, did the first the Muslims arrive in South Africa? Apparently the first um, number of Muslims of whom we have no record whatsoever um, in terms of the background, who they were, their descent, and uh, where they came from in specific, uh, was in fact in 1657. Um, and that was before the, the, um, the arrival of Tuang Mahmud and others um, on the Palsbrook in 1697. So the history of Islam goes back quite a long way. But there is no evidence, unfortunately, to show what sort of impact, impact um, that first group of Muslims had on, on the Muslims, other than, of course, in 1667, with the arrival of the Pauls, Brook Tuang Mahmud, and uh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman, Matibi Shah. There's something that seems to make Cape Town's history slightly more unique, perhaps, yeah. and that is that we have a lot of olia or saints yeah. buried um, in our environs, and it seems yeah. like that, that these people have played a major role in, in shaping Cape Town's community. I mean, yeah. who are some of these personalities, and how do they shape our lives? In a major way. In fact, uh, Professor Mason did a comparative study of, and he interviewed me on this, um, between the three slaveholding societies, and that was Cape Town, Brazil, and the United States. And to his absolute amazement, he found that in both countries, Islam had been annihilated, obliterated completely. Um, any reason for that? Well, I have, and I share partly with him his reasons. One of the reasons I believe that Islam survived at the Cape, up against um, two other slave holding societies, such as Brazil and the United States of America, is the presence of the Oriya. That the quality of Muslims who came here. Um, who are of a much higher quality than those in terms of the learning than those who went over there. Um, are, are you saying that, that, they, that they were actually scholars, scholars of Islam that came? In fact, I think they made a mistake to bring them here. <laughs> um, th ironically, the Cape is called, we all know it's called the, the, the Cape of, of Good Hope. Why is it called the Cape of Good Hope? Because Henry the Navigator had the Good Hope that Islam would be destroyed from here. And so he called it the Cape of Good Hope. Um, the name is stuck, of course, and uh, very few Muslims are aware of that. But that's the reason why. And the mistake I think they made was to bring people like Sheikh Yusuf of Makassar, like Tong Mahmoud, um, like Sheikh Abdul Rahman Matib Isha, uh, Sayyid Tong Alawi, <coughs> um, Bismillah Isha, the one just up the road here by us. Um, oh, a whole host of them, you know, some of the students even of Sheikh Yusuf who, st who, st who stayed behind, like Sheikh Sh Hassan Khibisha, mm. up, on, um, up at Signal Signal Hill. Um, these people kept Islam alive. N but Islam, of course, was banned at the time by the statu statutes of India. So how did it survive? Uh, 
it survived within the homes of people. Um, there is a, or the musallas, there were special rooms dedicated in Muslim households, which was called a langa, taken and derived from the Malay word linga, um, which has uh, um, not very spiritual connotations, but in terms of a culture of those people, um, it had. For us, it would be obscene to even translate the word. But um, it was taken from that form of worship. The name was, was, was drawn over. Even the, the term puasa that we use is a Malayu, it's a, it's a Malayu Hindu term. And does it mean Ramadan? Puasa at all, that does not mean Ramadan at all. It means some sort of sacrifice, but not Ramadan. And it's got nothing to do with Ramadan as we understand it in Islam as such. But this shows, you know, the, um, the sort of cross-pollination and the way in which the Muslims here almost Islamize certain words mm. um, and uh, words with which they could identify. So we had the Creolized versions of Dutch and Portuguese and Malayu all um, all together. But it was in these langars, these spiritual retreats, I would call them, within the homes of people, that the adhkar, the dhikrs of Sheikh Yusuf, of people like Sheikh Yusuf, of Tawang Mahmud, and they were Qadris, for example. Sheikh Yusuf was a khawati of Bismillah Hisha, people like Tawang Sayyid Alawi, who was a missionary for the Ba'a Alawi Tariqa. Um, there they practiced the Maulids. These were the practices, in my opinion, that kept Islam, because it was done sort of outside the reach of the of the colonial um, state and and, gov and government and, and and the rulers. They could continue to practice this. In fact, one of the lecturers I spoke to at Mukura um, believed that Islam had survived had survived in Russia in a similar way, and also in China, where both possession and distribution of the Quran were banned. Um, that Islam there in Russia had also survived through the Sufi orders, Tariqas. So it is so that is one of the reasons, Shafiq, why it is so difficult for these people who come in here and who try, you know, to charge us with the uh, uh, sin of shirk of uh, you know polytheism and bid'ah and malicious um, innovations uh, in our in our religion. That they will have an enormous task in trying to, to obliterate these practices. Because these were the practices that had kept Islam alive in the homes of people. And why specifically do I say that? Because by the end of the 20th century, there were a number of mosques already built. But they were built in opposition one to the other. Um, one imam took the other imam to court. There was enormous animosity. The, the masjid or the mosques in Cape Town, in fact, became the center points of conflict and not of unity amongst Muslims. And this is well known. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Davids has written extensively about this. Each and every Muslim knows this. Look at, look at the archives. You will see one lawsuit after the other um, to the point of embarrassment. So it was not the mosque as such that played this vital role in sustaining and protecting Islam. It was the home. And within the homes, the langas, or those spiritual retreats, where the maulids continued, where the adhkar continued, where the recitals of Surah Yasin and the Thursday night recitals um, uh, took place. These were the vehicles and the channels through which Islam sustained itself right up until today. But I have to remind you, Yer Shafiq, that while we might Describe ignorance to the, particularly in the 19th century, um, Islam after the death of Twanguru, of course, in 1807, and then the banning of slavery in 1834 and its final implementation in 1888. The slave trade stopped. There were no more Muslims coming in here, and there was this massive vacuum um, that 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 had had. Um, that had appeared within uh, Muslim culture. Imagine any society without education for a hundred years, whether it's secular, religious. I mean, you know, we need hardly think about it to understand how catastrophic 
those um, consequences could be, but they were not unaware of it. And I have here a, a letter found in the archives, along with um, the assistance of our late brother, Dr. Ahmed Davids, by this Shaykh Abdul Qadir, Bismillah Hisha, up top here, to show the suffering that these people went through. And, and sorry, no, this is a Sheikh who's buried uh, very, very close to the Zawiyah. To the Azawiyah. It's just across up the, on the mountain up, up side. The mountain, in fact, are from Ustra, you can in fact see it. And uh, you've got a brilliant photograph of that, I know. They were, they were from the Bougainis clan in, in um, Indonesia. And there were a number of Bougainese who were out in Stellenbosch. They scattered the Muslims widely. <coughs> Some of them in Makassar, as we know, Sheikh Yusuf, across Constantia. At that time, was probably quite far from the center of, of things here in Cape Town. Swellendam, where my grandfather um, came from and where he was, was born, and then places like Stellenbosch, where they could control them. They divided them. But listen to this letter, and it's such a moving one. And a number of them wrote to this Bismillah Hisha because he was a highly respected mm. um, individual within Bougainese society. And that is why I say they brought along people here, um, the colonialists, you know. Um, they write, this letter comes as a message from Stellenbosch you sent me. Brother September, I announced that I have been sick for two months and that no human medicine can cure me. Brother September, he's referring to Bismillah Hisha. The slaves were called by months. If they arrived in September, they disembarked, your name is September. If they arrived on a Friday, your name would be Friday, etc. So he is Brother September. I seek encouragement from you because I know you care about our Bougainese people. I request from you, brother, if you have compassion, actually for your Bougainese race, because I know from the time we spoke with our fellow Bougainese people, you said we were suffering and that this concerned you, for we are a broken, suffering people in miserable conditions. Thus my request to you, Brother September, if you are compassionate for your suffering Bougainese compatriots, Will you lead the children who came from this place of Bulu Bulu and Sanja? It is such a, mo a moving piece that they wrote to him, they appealed to him. This letter unfortunately landed up in the wrong hands. It landed up in the hands of the state. And he was either farming or tending to sheep along the slopes of Devil's Week. With this letter, they went out, they arrested him. They undressed him, he was naked. There were four or five of his followers who were there to do the burial afterwards. They tied him to the wheel and they stretched him limb by limb until his entire body split and tore apart. And those who stood there looked at him with all the misery and compassion and pain that they, in the trauma of having to watch their leader being torn apart in this way. But what amazed them, that for as long as they stretched him, and this is one of the most painful deaths imaginable, the man did not utter a single word of pain. And that is the reason why these people like the others who had been incarcerated on Robben Island, they had been incarcerated elsewhere in the in the in the in the castle down. You can still see the fingernails um, on the walls of those dungeons. These were the people I think who stood for Islam, who lived with the vicars and the molads and the love for the sof, who made Islam possible and as strong as it is for us today in the Cape. Just, Raj, just, just very briefly, um, our, our last point in this interview, Islam, it survived slavery, it managed to get its way through colonialism, but then there's also been the apartheid era, the post-apartheid era, and of course the impact that it's, uh, it's had on the, the townships. I mean, your, your, your quick take on that. Oh yes, of course, before uh, 
Muslims played a vital role, as we know, in the um, fight against apartheid. In fact, we are, are dis disproportionately represented in government, as you know, up to day, uh, up till today, because of the um, immense contribution uh, that Muslims did. Um, we can think of so many organizations, the Call of Islam, Ibrahim Rasul, our uh, past um, uh, premier at, at, at the Cape, was uh, the head of the Call of Islam. Uh, Dr. Farid uh, Esak, for example, another great activist. Um, so many of them, Hassan Solomon, um, alayhi, who had just recently passed away. All of these Muslims played in, no, in you know, enormous roles in, in, in breaking down you know, the rather tight scaffolding of this monster called apartheid. Um, the Azawiya you know, in its own way, played a very important role. For example, I can just I can just very very, very quickly mention to you. Although the focus here has always been on education um, and not on the revolution as such, but in 1947, my father, along with your father-in-law, Sheikh Ibrahim Hendrix, and my uncle, the great Sheikh Mahadi, who taught me the Ikhya, uh, were offered um, white identity because they were trying to garner votes at the time. The voting took place in 1948, as you know. And the apartheid state was instituted then. And that radicalized uh, Shah Ibrahim tremendously. He rejected it completely and went on, went on a campaign, you know, an anti-apartheid campaign of which we have, uh, um, you know, documents here to, be, to bear witness to that. And in 1955, he had his uh, passport removed and he had to smuggle out um, people like uh, Abu Bakr van der Skaif, uh, someone whom I was pleased to meet in Makkah at the time, because he never returned back to South Africa. And um, I myself on a night um, when I came up to classes, I saw these people trying to record what Sheikh Mahari was saying. They were, they were hidden behind the door, and when they saw me coming up the steps, they sort of moved, you know, they were skulking in the dark, and I just uh, scattering, and they had their um, radio equipment with them, and they, they rushed out. There were plants right in the masjid. To listen to them, and Shemahri was, of course, um, aware of that. I myself uh, was probably one of the most activists and um, had the good fortune of landing up in prison for a short while. But it was all done in good faith. I think um, there was no hostility, no animosity. And um, I remember when I was, I was asked in to talk. Um, I was there with the Call of Islam, members of the Call of Islam, and they asked me to deliver a talk in uh, the Caledon Square prison. It was a risk I took, but I just reminded them, and I think in the spirit of Islam, that um, people should not be judged by their color, and that we should show no hostility to the guard standing there at the door who was taking care of us. Not taking care of us, but ensuring that we um, you know, were in line and were obeying orders and, and, and behaved ourselves. Um, I turned to him in my speech and I said that, um, remember that oppression is not the, it's not the providence of a particular group of people or a particular race or ethnicity. I mean, it's a mindset. It's built on conditioned prejudices. And that he, as much as everyone else engaging in oppression of this country, is a dehumanized being. And uh, he needs our help as much as everyone else needs or help when it comes to freeing people from the shackles of the oppressive attitudes. He was very angered by what I said and turned the stun gun on me and then threatened to shoot us. And he ran around and people started to panic. He closed the windows, um, but he didn't go beyond that. Um, so that is a little experience I had. And I'm thankful for the fact that I could have a say in, you know, the, the destiny of, of, of this particular country. But the focus, of course, was not on revolution as such here. It was more on education, de educating people within the ethics and the morality of Islam. Well, because well, without, yes, yes. without that morality, mm -hmm. um, we could hardly call a revolution a revolution in the first place. Would you say that the, the, the major impact of, of the Zavia on the post-apartheid landscape reaching out to other South Africans as well has in fact actually been education and education based on the, the ethos of the Ihya. I think it will always be that. I am inspired by it. My brother Shahmad is inspired by it. All of us are inspired by that. Um, that is a project that will never end. In fact, in the post-apartheid uh, 
um, era, I think that there is a need for an even greater emphasis at this stage um, on, 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 on um, the spiritual, moral, spiritual aspects of Islam, the ethical aspects, and uh, just the genuine and authentic teachings. Uh, living in a society as open as it is today, um, it is an embarrassment uh, when uh, when we have, when we are confronted at times with the uh, and accosted almost to the sorts of ignorance that we that that we are witness to sometimes. So it is important that as Muslims that we focus on these issues, that we support institutions that have Islamic education at heart, and the and the and and not only just institutions but yes, an excellence within those institutions. Because as Muslims, we are all commanded with ihsan. Um, an ihsan that is determined by our consciousness of Allah Ta'ala and consequently a consciousness that would determine the quality of education and attitudes that we assist in uh, trying to engender within our Muslim community and also with equal respect to the non-Muslim societies. Sheikh Sadraj Hendricks, thanks for chatting to us. Shukran, Jazakallah Khair. It was a pleasure, Shafiq.